Our next uh, presentation is on the potential impacts of genetics, genomics, and breeding for organic fruit production. It will be presented by Kate Evans. Kate took over the uh, Pulmology Fruit Breeding Program at Washington State University in 2008. Before that, she spent 16 years at the East Malling Research Station in the United Kingdom running the Palm Fruit Breeding Program and managing projects on the development application of molecular tools for pomological fruit breeding. She's actively involved with the U.S. Rose Breed Genomics Genetics Project and other international efforts in fruit improvement. Kate. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to come and speak to you today. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and address the potential impacts of genetics, genomics and breeding on organic fruit production. You've heard a lot already this morning about uh, the, 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 the genetics is, is key to, to success in terms of development of new varieties for organic fruit production. What I'm going to do is concentrate on using um, genetics and genomics to sustain disease resistance um, just for, for this particular presentation. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, traditional breeding and then move into DNA-assisted breeding, and then perhaps, hopefully not too controversially, talk a little bit about GM, but also fast-track breeding. So traditional breeding. This is a schema of my breeding program here in um, Washington State. Uh, it's a fairly typical breeding program. Uh, I breed apples, I should say. <laughs> um, one thing about uh, that we've heard already about um, apples uh, and, and release of new varieties is, is what happens when we get beyond the breeding program in terms of uh, market share. Is it How easy is it to get our new varieties out into the market? Um, that's the same issue really with conventional and, uh, and apples for organic production. It's uh, a new variety needs marketing. It needs, um, it needs an awful lot of money put in there to get shelf space. Our varieties are known by name. That's one of our big issues. So it's it's certainly um, something that that is is on the mind of I think probably every apple breeder. The the other thing that's really key to point out here. Um, I hope you've noticed the time scale up here. It's not a fast process. Um, is that at this end we have an issue with with apple and the fact that apple has a juvenility period. As a seedling, it takes a number of years to get through that. Uh, to get the, the seedling to bloom and to fruit. We can manage that and speed that, that up uh, somewhat by, by using a, a rootstock. We propagate our seedlings onto a dwarfing, precocious rootstock to try and speed up this process. But it still takes around uh, five to six years before we get to see any fruit. Without the use of a rootstock, that might take 10 years. Um, what I'm going to do is to go through a, um, a schema for breeding scab resistance. Uh, nice, we've had a nice introduction to apple scab this morning. Um, I picked this example because there is a, a really nice published pedigree for, for this particular apple, Crimson Crisp. Um, this came out of the uh, Purdue Rickers Illinois program uh, here in the US and is a scab resistant variety with the, the VF gene that comes from Malus floribunda, which is this uh, really high quality apple up here. Um, you can see Malus floribunda HE1 specifically is down here at the bottom of the pedigree. So I brought this up really uh, to show you the number of generations that it takes in a, in a breeding program to get from this type of small fruited crab apple um, through to, to a, a, a really good quality dessert apple. Um, you can see the, the generations here, we're talking sort of five, six generations. And in fact, this cross, the first cross here, was um, made in about 1945. And the final cross for Crimson Crisp was 1971. So it's not a fast process. Unfortunately, most of our sources of disease and pest resistance in apple are from this type of apple. Um, certainly, when we go back um, any number of years, breeders have been using crab, crab apple types as, as sources of resistance. So when we're looking at using these, uh, we've identified a number of major genes from these. Um, it is going to take us a number of different generations to get through to good quality fruit. And then, of course, our resistance needs, needs managing, particularly if it's from a single gene. 
we've heard a little bit about resistance uh, management strategies this morning in terms of uh, dealing with scab resistance in the orchard. Um, but from a, from a breeding point of view, one way that we can do that is to use what's called gene pyramiding. When we have a major gene source of resistance in a crop like apple, we're facing the fact that our, we expect our apple trees to stay in the ground for tens of years. We're not looking at an annual crop. Unfortunately, our pathogen goes through many generations in the orchard. Um, and so there is a, a strong probability that, that some of these pathogens will overcome these single gene sources of resistance. And in fact, that has already happened with the, the VF gene from Malus chlorobunda in, in some countries. So gene pyramiding is, is something that, that we breeders are, are working on to try and improve the sustainability of disease resistance. I've changed diseases now as a, an example, just to kind of keep you awake. Um, we're on to powdery mildew resistance, um, and partly I've done this because this was some work that I worked on a number of years ago. We have already in Apple at least six different sources of major gene resistance to powdery mildew. So we've got uh, a sort of... Um, a, a, a series of, of, of tools that we can use in terms of, of, of resistances uh, in, in our breeding programs. Um, however, one issue that we have as a breeder is that we can, we can add in these, these genes through traditional breeding and we can get our, our seedlings in the greenhouse. This is just a, a typical progeny um, showing segregation between resistance and susceptibility to powdery mildew. Uh, and we can start to pyramid in these genes so we can we can make crosses combining these different sources of resistance. What's very difficult using traditional breeding is to identify which ones of these resistant seedlings have actually got more than one gene in. We can do some fairly complicated um, uh, pathology experiments, I guess, uh, looking at using different races of some of these diseases. But for some 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 things like powdery mildew, actually that's that's quite difficult. Um, and, and it's, it's, it takes an, a number of, um, or it takes a certain amount of time to do that. So what, one thing that we've been working on is the development of DNA-assisted breeding techniques uh, to enable us to, to identify these pyramided resistances. So when I'm talking about um, DNA-assisted breeding, what I'm really talking about is using linked DNA markers that enable us to identify uh, some of these characteristics in the seedlings at a very early stage. Um, this uh, photo on the, the right just shows you two markers that, that um, my group identified in the late 90s, I guess, to, to two different mildew resistance genes. These come from uh, totally different sources um, in Apple. Uh, all of the, the seedlings that you can see represented in tracks two to nine were actually resistant seedlings from this particular cross. Uh, but it wasn't until we developed these linked markers and used them to screen the, the progeny that we could identify that, in fact, I think it's seedlings in, in track three and seven um, are, are the only two seedlings uh, in that particular group that have both of those resistance genes. So using these, these DNA linked, link, these, yeah, DNA linked markers are, has, has opened up this opportunity for us to be able to select for this more durable um, resistance. So what DNA markers have we already got? Uh, we have quite a, quite a number of them now. Um, we've been working on this, I guess, um, in, in a worldwide effort, probably since the uh, early 90s. Uh, so powdery mildew, I showed you already. We have, um, I think, four or five different markers for different powdery mildew resistance genes. For apple scab, um, again, there are a number of different markers that breeders are using already for different um, different sources of resistance. We've got some, some markers for some aphid resistances. Um, depending on where you live, um, you might see some, some of these kind of symptoms. We get this one here, woolly apple aphid. And there are sources of resistance and there are markers for woolly apple aphid resistance already. Fire blight is more of a problem. Um, there certainly are markers that are linked to fire blight resistance. Um, but unlike many of the, the other resistances, much of what we know about fire blight resistance is that we're focusing on using what are called quantitative trait um, resistances rather than single major gene resistances. So it's, it's, it's just a more complicated thing for, for us to use and to incorporate into, um, into a breeding program. Um, 
But, you know, we are making really good progress in doing this. And, and it's been a fairly short period of time that we've been uh, working on, on developing the markers. We've now got um, a whole lot of them. And so, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're, we're really making progress. One thing that I wanted to point out is that we're interested in, in using new sources of diversity for, for our breeding. Um, Malus diversii is, uh, is represented here, as uh, you can see, compared to the, the Malus floribunda type of apple, the wild sort of apple, it's actually a much higher quality apple. Um, and so starting from, from that point of view, in terms of, of bringing in some Malus diversii traits, we're going to be um, in, a, in a better position than starting with those small fruited crabs. Malus diversii comes from the uh, Central Asia, from Kazakhstan, and is thought to be um, the, the sort of center of, of origin of our domestic apple today. And there have been a number of collecting trips over the years to bring in material from, from Kazakhstan uh, into the US and into other collections worldwide. And that material has been um, characterized for a lot of it for disease resistance. So we now have access to a lot of this, um, this material to, for, for us to use in our, in our programs. One of the, the Malus Seversiae accessions that we're using here in, in, in Washington State is um, it has a source of fire blight resistance. Um, when I said to you bef before that they're not easy sources of resistance to, to work with, you can see here that this, these, are, these are actually seedlings that are segregating from, from just one progeny. Uh, and and they, they range in resistance from something very nice over here to something not very nice over here. Uh, so it's not it's not a clear cut resistance at all, but we have made a lot of progress in doing in 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 identifying these markers, um, and I'm fairly confident that we'll be able to to use them and to bring in some really good fire blight resistance um, at some point in the future. <laughs> um, so can we speed things up? That's the next question. So we're obviously interested in introgressing resistances from Malus seversii. I said it was a better quality apple than the crab apple types that we've used in the past. Um, but it will still take us a number of generations to get through um, and, and to, to really bring in the sort of quality that we want. Well, that's when we need to think about some other techniques. Um, and I'm going to talk briefly about genetic modification and then also about fast track breeding. So just to kind of clarify, um, I think that uh, obviously genetic modification and the organics movement are not always um, best buddies. Uh, but I think it's, it's worth pointing out the difference in some of the different genetic modification techniques that there are around. Transgenics is always the one that people have, have got the most negative feelings about, where you're bringing in a gene sequence from one organism and putting it into a, a totally unrelated organism. Cisgenics, however, is something that is, is now um, uh, an interesting focus of attention. It's where you're transferring a gene artificially from one organism that it could always be conventionally bred into. Uh, so in other words, you're taking an apple gene and you're transferring it into a variety of apple. So um, I have an example of that in a minute. Um, cisgenics is uh, at the moment um, sort of kind of fighting its way through the, the European legislation. Um, and, and, and so I'm not quite sure at what point and, and whether it will be accepted or not in a different manner to transgenics. Transient gene silencing is, is, again, something very different. It's not adding a new gene. It's just um, switching off a gene that's already in the, in the um, organism. So an example of using uh, what is effectively cisgenics, although it says transgenics in the title of this publication, um, this was in 2004, the, the VF gene, this, this gene for apple scab resistance from um, Malus Roar Bunder 821 was isolated and cloned, and it has been introduced into Gala. So there is now scab resistant Gala. Of course, we have to think about the, the advantages of doing this kind of thing as opposed to using traditional breeding, where we've been talking about developing a market for our, traditional, our traditionally bred varieties. Everything's new, everything's unique at the end. Something like this would, of course, be Gala ultimately. However, um, we should also think about uh, what about this kind of technology for rootstocks? We've talked about uh, using uh, improved rootstocks for organic production. Would there be a more acceptable use of, of this kind of technology in a rootstock rather than a scion? We have now the genome sequence for Apple. We, are, uh, we have in our hands the capability of identifying an awful lot more of these genes. So we are really, you know, at the forefront of, of moving this forward right now. 
Fast track breeding. What's fast track breeding? Well, fast track breeding gives us the capability of producing essentially something that's now classed as a non-GM apple, uh, but using some GM technology along the way. So uh, the, this particular gene, the, uh, the FT gene, is an early flowering gene. It was um, isolated from birch and from poplar and has been used by various groups uh, into to fruit trees to try and induce early flowering. And in fact, it works pretty well, as you can see up here. You can get uh, flowers within uh, a year when you use this technology. There's a group, a German group here, Flakowski's group in, in Dresden, who've been doing this work in Apple. Um, and here in the US, Ralph Scorza's group has been using it in Plum. Um, these are actually plums because I haven't been and seen the, the German apples, but I have been and seen the, uh, the U.S. plums. They produce some slightly strange looking trees from a habit point of view because they flower so soon. The advantage from a breeding point of view of using these is that we can cycle through generations very quickly. So going back to my illustration of this pedigree that I showed you earlier on, we look at the time scale of this when we're looking at about five years per generation that's a tr traditional breeding if we can use uh, the fast track system where we've got some early flowering in there to to enable us to race through our generations we can bring this right down um, to sort of 10 years as opposed to this this time scale and what's really neat about this is that uh, in the same way that our other genes segregate in a progeny when we make a traditional cross we can, uh, when we make our final cross, we can actually select out the, the early flowering gene and, and then the GM part, and so end up with something that's essentially regarded as a non-GM product. We can't, however, do any of this without the development of all of the DNA markers. So we need, of course, those markers that I talked about for disease resistance, but in order to be able to select through our seedlings very quickly, we need to have markers that are linked to fruit quality, and that's something that's taking uh, somewhat more time. Um, obviously, fruit quality is much more complicated than disease resistance when you start to try, try and sort of pull apart the genetics of it. Um, but we're combining that kind of the, the DNA assisted breeding um, with, with this sort of selection. And hopefully tomorrow on the field tour, you'll come out and see some of the, the plots that we're using to identify some of these, um, these DNA markers. So just to kind of finish, what can the fruit breeder offer to organic growers? Well, you know, I, I've talked about using genetics and genomics to sustain disease resistance, but there are other things as well. What about out-competing orchard weeds? For example, when we go back to rootstocks, Genaro Fazio's program in the U.S. is already starting to pull apart some of the genetic control of mineral uptake. Well, you know, that's a huge leap forward to where we've been um, in the past. And of course, you know, I mentioned GM rootstocks. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> um, and what about improving storage potential? We've already got these this, these sorts of genetics in our breeding programs now. This is um, the first release from my breeding program, WA2. It's very long storing and will enable some uh, organic production without without the addition of, of chemicals that are needed to, to improve storage. So from my perspective, I feel that, that we as breeders can produce varieties now that are better suited to organic production and then and ensure a, a sustainable future of consistently good quality fruit. Thank you very much for listening.